Hello, everybody. Uh, this is George Kunis with Zesto Audio. And uh, today I'm going to talk a, a little bit about the RIAA curve and why is it you need one. Now, uh, I, I'm going to give you a little bit of history, but I'm not going to really get into the full technical um, uh, math and everything else that goes into the exact science of it, but give you a little overview uh, and uh, so that you could get a sense of uh, how, how it works and how important it is to have it working properly. So um, when you go back to early recordings, uh, let, let, let's skip forward to 78 uh, music recordings on 78 RPM records. They had some basic uh, basic problems. Uh, as you can imagine, there wasn't a whole uh, uh, length of time of to be able to put things on to record on. Uh, they uh, there was short shortage of time and length, and uh, it didn't sound that great. I mean, you know, I mean, there was very little bass, and uh, it was really scratchy and noisy. So. People could still enjoy the music, but it wasn't particularly uh, uh, great. It could definitely be improved on. And uh, back in uh, 1926, uh, somebody at Bell Labs decided that perhaps uh, there may be a couple of issues that could be resolved uh, to solve these from an engineering point of view and solve these problems and, and make an improvement. Well, let me uh, let me pull up a slide here which shows you what. Uh, uh, here's a slide with uh, a needle being stylus, of course, but a needle uh, going through a groove. Now, the large waves side to side are the bass, and the smaller indentations are the high frequencies. Uh, that's how much detail there is in a, in a vinyl record, by the way. Um, but uh, the bass was a was problem because you needed a, a wide groove in order to properly record and reproduce the bass. And so two issues with that. One, uh, it would reduce the length of time you could record uh, because it, uh, you, you, it needed more space physically. You don't want the grooves touching each other. So you had to have something, some way of uh, uh, you know, putting them apart a certain distance. And then uh, also, it's really difficult to play back a bass with uh, that much movement. The stylus would literally fly out of the uh, record if you did. It would just not be able to track at all. And then, um, so that was one of the problems. And then the other one was the, um, uh, the, the hiss, the scratchiness and the noise. And uh, the way they solved on this, the first, the first thing and most obvious is to change the speed. Yeah, you get you know almost double the amount by doing to 33 and a third instead of 78, um, and then a little uh, yeah, so a little more than double, and um, so that was the first thing. And then they realized that well, if they were to cut the bass and boost the treble, it would do two things. If you cut the bass when you're cutting the record. Uh, and boost the treble. By cutting the bass, you make the grooves narrower, and therefore you can get more information on the record. And by boosting the treble, what you're doing, and then uh, playing it and cutting it when you play back, and let me give you a sense of this. Here's the next slide. So here is, uh, and I'll go back to the RIAA curve and exactly what that means, but the, uh, here's what they did the blue dotted line that cut the bass and boosted the treble. This is how the cutting head cuts the record. So uh, in this uh, particular instance, it's showing you at 20 hertz on all the way on the left, which is the bass, uh, it's cutting 20 dBs, which is a massive amount. Of, and then all the way to the top right, it's 20 kilohertz at boosting it by 20 uh, 20 dB. So that's a massive boost. Now, when you play it back, if you use the opposite EQ, the red line, which is the playback RIAA curve, um, then you boost the bass at 20 hertz and you go all the way from the top left to the bottom right and you're cutting the highs by 20 kilohertz. And when you cut the highs, 
you are also cutting the surface noise. So the idea is you go, if you, if this is done right, this is the next slide, the two cancel out and you have a flat frequency response, the one that says playback in the middle. Now, uh, so, so the, the issue was that uh, when they first discovered this, they, uh, they tried to implement it and there was no standard. There has to have been 100 plus different uh, uh, equalization curves. Uh, emphasis and de-emphasis, as it's called. There had to have been, you know, some of them you've probably heard of, like Columbia and DECA, uh, AES. I mean, it goes on and on and on and on and on. Everyone had, and, and, you know, it, if you've got a record that had DECA and you don't have the DECA de-emphasis curve, then, what, you know, it's not going to sound that great. Well, Columbia or whatever it is, some of them are close enough that it worked. So, um, uh, in so the uh, RIAA, which is the Recording Industry Association of America, uh, which formed in uh, 1952, decided to stand to set a standard. There was an agreement well, with all the manufacturers and all the people that uh, were involved in the industry that they would set a standard for the RIAA curve, which is the one I just showed you. Let me flip it back up again here. Here's, here it is. This is the standard that the recording industry decided between 52 and 56, somewhere, you know, mid 50s, that they would implement. So when you get a record after 56, supposedly, or 55, uh, it is likely to have this kind of uh, EQ. The, the uh, lathe was set to cut the groove, uh, at, like the record uh, section, the green line, and uh, so then you would need a, a photo stage with the red line, which is uh, what we do, by the way. And, our, and the Zesto uh, audio phono stages all have the standard RIAA curve. So, all right, so this is all well and good until you get into the 70s. Then uh, people decided, the manufacturers decided that it was difficult to reproduce reproduce the base uh, properly because, uh, let me bring this back up one more time. Uh, so what happens is, on uh, you, if you see at the bottom of your slide, it says 100 hertz, that vertical line. Well, 60 hertz, which is hum, which is just to the left of it, you're turning the volume up on that thing a lot. So if you have electronics, uh, it has to be ultra quiet in order not to get a bunch of harm in it. Also, speakers were not always able to reproduce the low frequencies. So in the early 70s, uh, the manufacturers got together and uh, decided that they would uh, create a different standard, and I believe it's called the enhanced RIA curve. Now, I don't have a, a, a sample to show you, but basically they cut all the bass out. Uh, you cut the bass, then it doesn't matter. You don't have to uh, reproduce it, and the bass isn't there. And <clears throat> I believe when uh, records were cut in that period with uh, the enhanced R RIA curve, then uh, they just uh, they just didn't have a whole lot of bass in them intentionally. Now, th and this is partly why remastered albums sound so good. They have a, a more uh, a fuller sound, uh, and don't have the uh, and have the full bass. So, um, <clears throat> so, so when you when I let's go back to, uh, to <coughs> excuse me. So, so the RIAA curve, uh, even though it was a standardized in the mid fifties, uh, people played with it in the seventies. Now, in order to be able to design, as an engineer, my challenge was to design a phono stage that would uh, be able to reproduce uh, uh, the RIA curve as closely as possible, because that is really important. But equally important was to have a phono stage that was quiet, had a good black level, very low noise. And the way, and it's difficult by far, it's difficult to do. And uh, so the, 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 uh, uh, it, it has to do with grounding, it has to do with um, 
uh, how the power supplies are wired. It has to do proximity of the power supply. It's, there's a lot that's involved in in uh, in doing that. Uh, and the challenges we I had in order to be able to make that work. And uh, to give you a sense of that, our latest phono stage. Let me give you a quick shot of it. This is the Andros Deluxe phono stage that we just released. Uh, has all the latest technology in order to keep that noise quiet and to follow the RIAA curve as closely as possible. And part of that is if you look on the back, on the left side, there are ground lift switches, the ground on off, and the individual, one for the left and one for the right. And part of the problem is noise coming into the phono stage uh, because of the because of wiring, because of uh, mains power issues, and by switching those and their individual, you can greatly reduce the uh, the noise and uh, reduce that harm. Again, uh, IIAA. The good part is uh, you can get uh, a full sound from it, and uh, and it's quiet relatively to 78. So it's uh, uh, and, uh, and it has great bass, but also you're boosting the bass a lot internally when you in the phono stage, and uh, uh, it, it is tricky. And just to uh, just to add, uh, by the way, it, uh, uh, it, it, our phono stage, the uh, our top of the line phono stage, the Tessera, which has uh, built-in input, uh, four inputs and controls on the front and so on. Just one product of the year from uh, the absolute sound. So uh, we should be able to post that pretty soon. It's tricky designing phono stages. So the RI is, a, as I say, is a double uh, edged curve, double sided curve. You're double, that, so there's, uh, you know, you gotta, you gotta deal with it. But when it's done right, that it sounds really good. Anyway, hopefully that was uh, useful. Uh, thank you for your time. And we uh, will be back. I'll be back online next week. Thank you and goodbye.